I know that some of you are aware, but maybe not all, that uh, my husband, Adam, is a musician. He's not playing professionally right now, but that is his training. He has a bachelor's degree in music. And I don't know for sure if this is true of all musicians, although I think it's, it's fairly common. What I learned early on in our relationship, dating a musician, you never know what is going to be playing when you get in his truck. It could be anything. Musicians like Adam just appreciate good music, regardless of the genre. So you might get in and the radio is tuned to heavy metal, or the classical station, or it might be Tejano, or hip hop, or jazz, or techno. It could be anything. You never know what it'll be. We have been married going on 15 years now, and apparently something has rubbed off. Because I have started finding myself appreciating some, what others might consider rather eclectic music styles. I found something that he had never heard before. I consider this quite an accomplishment. I have discovered Siberian techno. It is a fusion of indigenous Siberian and Mongolian peoples plus modern techno or house music, which is very, um, for those of you uh, not familiar with those terms, uh, an electronically created music that has a, uh, a very definite beat to it. Um, usually uses keyboards or just computer keyboards sometimes. It's all electronic and um, usually pretty uh, fast paced. And, and this, this is an incredibly unique fusion. I mean, they use some slightly modified but traditional instruments of indigenous peoples, these instruments that are thousands of years old, plus modern keyboards and computers and effects, and Mongolian throat singing. It's surprisingly catchy. Just look it up, I'm saying. Now, your, your search history is never going to be the same if you do that. But it's... Hey, it's pretty fun. One of the features of this type of music, of any techno or house music, is um, this beat, this driving, this regular pulsating rhythm, almost like a, a heartbeat. Some people use this music, listen to it when they're working out. It makes them keep moving fast. Um, and, incidentally, it reminds me of Psalm 136. I know you have no idea how I got there yet, but you will. Hang on. Psalm 136, as most of the psalms in our Psalter, is written in a poetry form, but it's a rather unique one in that it is a, a total of, of 26 stanzas or, or verses, and they are paired lines. So there's twice that many lines of poetry, and every other line is the same. The repetition, God's faithful love lasts forever every other line. It, it goes like this. I won't read the whole thing, but I'll just read 
a part of it. And you are free to join in when you figure out what the pattern is. Give thanks to the Lord because he is good. God's faithful love lasts forever. Give thanks to the God of all gods. God's faithful love lasts forever. Give thanks to the Lord of all lords. God's faithful love lasts forever. Give thanks to the only one who makes great wonders. God's faithful love lasts forever. Give thanks to the one who made the skies with skill. God's faithful love lasts forever. Give thanks to the one who shaped the earth on the water. God's faithful love lasts forever. Give thanks to the one who made the great lights. God's faithful love lasts forever. The sun to rule the day. God's faithful love lasts forever. The moon and the stars to rule the night. God's faithful love lasts forever. God remembered us when we were humiliated. God's faithful love lasts forever. God rescued us from our enemies. God's faithful love lasts forever. God is the one who provides food for all living things. God's faithful love lasts forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven. God's faithful love lasts forever. Let us hear what the Spirit is speaking to God's people. It's a little repetitive, but you get the point. And the point is when you get to the point of, okay, yeah, I think I got it, it keeps going. Because just like God's love, it keeps going. Even when you think you got it, whether you need it or not, God's faithful love lasts forever. This morning, we're going to wrap up our Advent journey with the Grinch who stole Christmas. And as you heard a few moments ago with the children, the the best part of the book is the ending. After the Grinch has stolen all of the Who's presents and trees and food and all of those good things, and he takes that up to the top of Mount Crumpet, and he pauses. And we talked about that pregnant pause last week. The Grinch, in that pause, hears something. Hears something he was not expecting to hear. He expected to hear weeping and gnashing of teeth. But instead, he heard singing. He heard music. The original book doesn't tell us what that was, what song or what kind of music. We would kind of assume it was a Christmas carol, perhaps. In the television special, the 1966 special. Um, It was one of, uh, a song of Dr. Seuss's creation that he wrote in what came to be known as Seussian Latin. Basically, completely made up words that to most of us who don't know Latin sounded pretty reverent. Fahu fores, dahu dores. You know, that whole thing. Whatever it was that they sang, whether it was the words 
whether it was the notes, whether it was the, the voices or the key, the music moved him. Music often does that. And that pregnant pause that allowed the music to do its magic changed everything, completely changed how the story ended. Because the Grinch ends up returning all of the things that he took, but that's not the most incredible part, is it? The most amazing part, the part that, that gets hardly any words in the book, but the most incredible part, the part that really hints at the, the meaning of the whole thing, is that the Who's asked him to join them in their celebration. The Who's who'd been robbed of everything just hours before. Forgive the Grinch and have him at their table. In fact, they give him the seat of honor and he gets to carve the roast beast. What has happened here? This is incredible. Let's unpack that. What's happened is that it had to begin with forgiveness. The Who's forgave him. What is forgiveness? It's a tricky question. It's difficult to define. Matt Rawl says that forgiveness is refusing your right to harm someone in the way that she or he had harmed you. Now, forgiveness in and of itself is not the same thing as reconciliation. Forgiveness does not automatically make everything right. It does not instantly return relationships to what they were before the wrong occurred. Forgiveness is not the end of the process. It is the beginning. And that's one of the challenges about forgiveness, is that Jesus felt that it was pretty important. Of his last words to his disciples, one gospel records that from the cross he says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. In his parting words in Luke, he talks about forgiveness of sins and how they are charged with living that way and spreading that message. Rawl says, we are charged to forgive while we hope for reconciliation. Reconciliation follows forgiveness. And sometimes forgiveness takes a long time. Forgiveness is not an instantaneous event. No matter what you might have heard or what you might wish to believe or have even attempted before, Forgiveness usually takes 
several times to really take hold. In the musical Hamilton, anybody know the musical Hamilton? It's a few years old now. I love that musical. It is a retelling of the uh, American history story, the founding of our country in uh, a different language than most of us are used to, hip hop. And most of the songs are, are pretty fast paced and you have to listen pretty hard to get all of the lyrics. But there's this song toward the end of the second act, It's Quiet Uptown, that has a markedly different pace and tone. It is a somber, reflective song. See, at this point in the play, Alexander Hamilton has uh, risen to political prominence. He has been unfaithful to his wife. He has lost his oldest son in a duel, which was a ridiculously unnecessary ego battle. And his, he was faced with blackmail and accusations of uh, financial impropriety. And he chose to air the whole thing, the whole truth about his affair, rather than accept those accusations. In other words, he basically chose his reputation over his relationships. His wife, Eliza, has every reason to leave him or kick him out, to not put up with this anymore. But she doesn't. And for probably one of the, the smartest things Alexander does is he knows that there's nothing he can say that will fix what he's done. So for once in his life, he shuts up. And he doesn't say anything. And the song begins, Eliza sings. There are moments that the words don't read. There is suffering too terrible to name. And it talks about, during this time period, Alexander moves home, and he just sits with, with Eliza. He just takes the walks. He doesn't defend. He just shuts up and he spends the time with her. And they're seen walking about town a lot in silence. And she ends the song. There are moments that the words don't reach. There's a grace too powerful to name forgiveness. Can you imagine? While Dr. Seuss was a great theologian, he didn't preach and, and he didn't make the gospel explicit in his stories and especially in this one. But it's really obvious if you know what you're looking for. The final scene, the final illustration of the book, the Grinch at the head of the table, surrounded by the Who's. 
Matt Rawls says, something beautiful has taken place and how perfect it is that enemies are now around the same table sharing a meal with the least of these at the head of the table. The made-for-TV meaning of the story is that Christmas isn't just about presents, it's about something more. And if you're a Christ follower, you know what the something more is. That in Jesus, we experience the joy of reconciliation of God with us, always. Joy is the steadfast assurance that God is with us. This season of Advent, it might seem a little strange upon first reflection that We spend all this time, these four weeks, counting down, preparing for something that already happened, like 2,000 years ago. But it's so much more than that. We're not just preparing for a thing that already happened. We are preparing for Christ to come. As once in the form of an infant, Christ continues to come over and over again. Christ comes to us every day. Christ comes again in our hearts. And Christ will come again again to fulfill all things. So Advent is not a time of waiting for gifts. Advent is a time of waiting to recognize that the giver is the gift. That's the joy of Christmas. The indescribable joy of knowing that God's deep, profound love for us knows no end. That God joined us in our humanity to bring us closer to God. That hope, hope is what keeps us going working for peace with justice, even when that seems impossible, and joy. Joy is timeless, and it is what we find when we stop looking for ourselves and find our true hearts and souls in who God created us to be. That is the wholeness, the reconciliation, the joy that we anticipate and celebrate at Christmas. And it is the joy the joy of our salvation that transforms us, that changes us, and indeed changes the world.
I'm so glad that you chose to begin your week in worship with us, and especially to begin your Christmas Eve morning. I know that you have many preparations and plans and other things to do and places to be, and we do recognize and appreciate that you chose to be here. So thank you. If you have felt the nudge of the Spirit this morning, whether that is to accept Christ for the first time or to reaffirm your faith in Christ or perhaps to make the next step in your journey of faith, if you would like to to talk with me about what that might be, if you would, le- would like some help discerning what that looks like for you, I would love to do that. My information is here on your bulletin on the prayer concerns page. And if you would like to make a decision and, and if you're ready to make that known this morning, then I would love to hear about it. Please come and share that with me as we all stand and sing together our closing song.